Um, right. So uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, start today's workshop. My name is Stanley Xu. I'm an assistant research fellow uh, here in Academia Sinica at the Institute of Biological Chemistry. Um, it's also a pleasure for us as um, a new partner to this European project, We Young MR. Um, so in the previous years, we, we organized this workshop for two years already. Um, Alexander was very kind to visit us several times. And, and this time, since we just became the official partner for this European project, uh, we extended it to become a three-day workshop. Uh, we'll start today first focusing on SACS applications. And I know some of you are uh, not NMR spectroscopists, but are interested in uh, structural biology in general, or grid computing in general. So um, we will start with SACS first, and then uh, tomorrow will be a mixture between SACS and NMR, and then th the final day we'll be talking about uh, small molecule docking or protein-protein uh, docking applications uh, within the WNMR um, program. Um, in the meantime, if because many of our uh, applications will require the uh, personal certificate for the grid access, um, I, some of you probably already applied for a certificate last year, but then you probably also realize that this certificate needs to be renewed every year. So if in the meantime you have problems with your personal certificate or, imp or importing the certificate into your browser, you can contact uh, Shikai, uh, who is sitting here. Who he will be helping you uh, with the certificate application um, through the EU Asia um, grid. And then you probably have to register again to the EMR VO. Uh, these are two separate virtual organizations. Um, so uh, again, it's a great pleasure to start today's session uh, by introducing Professor Alexander Bovin. Uh, he's uh, the program coordinator of WNMR. Uh, he's also uh, a professor at uh, Utrecht University, um, uh, specializing in uh, computational structural biology. Um, he will start uh, introducing a, a general overview about WNMR, and we really look forward to the three-day program. Okay. Thank you very much, Danny. It's a pleasure to be back in Taipei. And uh, thank you, Danny, and all the team from uh, Academia Sinica for organizing this workshop. Where we'll be spending the next three days telling you about various aspects of uh, structural biology and the use of grid computing, in particular in structural biology. Before you can really start with hearing the science, because you are here probably for the science and the, and the sacs today, so you have to listen for me, to me for the next hour, where I'm going to present you a little bit about the project, WNMR, what we are doing and what this is about. And after coffee, the, the real science is going to start with, with Al, who is going to tell you everything you want to know or not about sacs. So <clears throat> WNMR is, uh, stands for Worldwide Infrastructure, E-Infrastructure, Computational Infrastructure for NMR and Structural Biology in, uh, in the large sense of it. Uh, I'm the project coordinator of, of WNMR. So so WNMR is uh, a European project. It's an FP7 project under the Infrastructure uh, Directorate. And we have a large team of, uh, of partners. And if you see down there, one of the last one uh, showing up in a list is Academia Sinica. And we are very glad to be able to add Academia Sinica as a partner this year or last year, uh, which is uh, helping us very much in targeting all of uh, Asia Pacific region in, uh, uh, in our project. And you see there, well, Utrecht is represented. Uh, we have Frankfurt, Florence large NMR center as well, the National Institute of Physics in Italy. These are our grid specialists, and some of you in grid business probably know those people. Uh, we have uh, Radboud University, that's another university in, in the Netherlands, 
uh, Cambridge. Those two are involved in, uh, in parts that are more to do with validation of structure. So you, you can cre generate structure of molecules, biomolecules, but you also have to validate them to make sure that they make sense. EMBL, Hamburg is there, and these are our SACS experts. And uh, Al will tell you everything about SACS later on. Then there is a small company, Sprunk NMR, who is also involved in the project. So WeNMR is about structural biology, so we're interested in, in, in looking at uh, the molecule of life, of course, and this is uh, uh, one example. It's a snapshot taken out of uh, a movie created by Sprunk NMR, our small partner, to illustrate the use of, uh, of NMR in structural biology, or NMR can, uh, can be used to structure to study biomolecules, and you can, if you look for bio-NMR in YouTube, you will find the entire movie. Uh, some of you might be familiar with NMR, some are not. So this is the instrumentation that, that we use. The sample goes in, and then we can get structural and dynamic information uh, from these kind of measurements. There's actually a text going with this, uh, with this movie, so you should uh, take the time to watch it on YouTube because it's, it's really nice. And what you see appearing in the background now is kind of an NMR spectrum, but it's more than an NMR spectrum. Actually, it's showing you the uh, research infrastructure in Europe for NMR. You see the map of Europe appearing, and these are all center, NMR centers in Europe that are uh, who are collaborating in this bio-NMR project. So bio-NMR is an experimental infrastructure project in Europe to provide access to, to high-field NMR uh, to users. Utrecht is here, if you are wondering where we are coming from. And... Uh, so you see Florence down there. Um, so all those centers are collaborating, providing access to users. But those users also need computing to interpret the data, because the NMR process from data to structure is a compl complex one. It's much more complex than, than X-ray crystallography. In X-ray, you have a well-defined, usually, a relationship between the data that you measure, or you have the images, then you get your reflections. And then from there, you go directly straight to the structure. In NMR, you need to do a lot of experiments to be able first to assign signal to specific atoms. And once you have done all this information, once you have all this information, you can start collecting structural data to calculate structure. So there's not a one-to-one -one direct pathway between the data and the structure like there is in X-ray. And uh, so, so it's a complex process which, use also, which requires a lot of human intervention. Uh, so this will be the data acquisition part. So these are signal intensity as function of time, some kind of fluctuation, fluctuating signals that you need to process to get those kind of spectra. You need to assign those spectra, so you need to put a name or a couple of names of atoms to each of those signals. And once you have done this resonance assignment step, you can start going to the structure part where the computation, where the computations are at all stage of this process, of course, and you end up with this ensemble of structure. And this is not, uh, you have this arrow going in a, basically in a linear way, but you see there is also a cycle here. So you go typically in multiple steps to get to your final results. And at all steps, uh, there is some uh, amount of manual intervention, but also computational work required. And in WeNMR, basically, we set up to, to ease a bit this pathway, so to go from the data collection to the final product, which in our case will be structures, dynamics, interactions, uh, to, to try to ease this pathway by uh, providing protocols, tools, softwares uh, that allow some degrees of automation, building on the grid resources for the computation where possible. And we are also now adding, we have also added in WMR the, the SACS part, because SACS is, a, is also a solution technique which is very complementary to NMR and gives you also a lot of uh, useful information about biomolecules and their interaction. But this is uh, for Al to, to tell you everything about it. So some of you might not be familiar with the concept of grid computing, as, or maybe you are all familiar with the concept of grid computing. I don't know. So just a refresh of uh, what we are speaking. So a grid is a distributed and shared computational infrastructure. Uh, if you think of the web as being a large collection of data, the grid is a large collection of computational power and space. And uh, so we are using resources that are distributed uh, across Europe, but uh, also around the world. So actually, uh, as European project, we're also calculating here at this time at uh, Academia Sinica here. So we have resources here. Um, 
so it's a fair share system and it's, uh, it's opportunistic usage of resources. So you, you don't have resources that are allocated to you and that are reserved for the entire year. You, you grab resources wherever they are. Uh, the, large, the largest users of the grid uh, these days are still high energy physics. So a lot of the data pro produced at CERN are being processed by a large center around the world. Uh, and without this computational power of the grid, this kind of uh, the discovery of the X boson would not have been possible. And if you look uh, also in YouTube for X boson and EGI, you will find a nice uh, movie explaining how the grid has been contributing to this discovery. So it's, it's worth uh, looking at it. So in order to be able to use those distributed resources, so you're accessing computers of other people around the world, so there is some kind of security involved. And uh, usually people want to know who you are before they give you access to those resources. So you have to organize yourself in virtual organization uh, to, to be able to make use of the grid. So these virtual organizations are a group of, of people or institutions who share the computational resource of a grid for a common goal. So in WeNMR, we have a virtual organization which is called enmr.eu. So by signing up with enmr.eu, you get access to the resource center that are supporting us. And this is the reason why you need your personal certificate. So the personal certificate that some of you might have here in the room, some will apply for, gives you basically access to the grid. So it's your passport for the grid. So what are the main objectives of, of our project? So we want to, to develop and operate a science gateway for NMR and SAS communities in first instance, but it's not limited to that. We see that people outside those communities are making use of our services. It depends on the on the specific software application you're interested in. Uh, create a research platform where the, the, the community can, uh, can make use of for exchanging information with Tutorials Wiki. I'm going to show you much more of that. Uh, we are also helping uh, software developers to, to port their application to the grid if they're interested and, and promoting the use of, the, of grid computing, basically. And we also want to link to worldwide grid initiatives. So actually after this uh, after my lecture, I'm going to switch room to go to another workshop, which is about uh, uh, worldwide uh, grid initiatives and, and collaborations. So those of you who might be familiar with grid uh, must realize that it's, it's not a simple business. If you want to access from your computer uh, the grid resources and submit uh, jobs, it's, it's quite a complex system. And the, the, the software is not always very user friendly. So we have chosen to shield as much as possible the end user from the grid. So we don't want to expose you to, the, to all the complexity of the grid. And it, this means that we are usually providing protocolized access to the grid. So we are defining what kind of computations are running on the grid. And you as user are interacting mainly with web portals. So there is not much different than using a regular web portals for, for any kind of, of software for application. Uh, so what about the, the virtual research community? So a few words here. So the virtual research community website, the WNMR VRC basically, is, is, has been designed to be really the e-science hub in the cloud, where you get uh, community aspects of it, and I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Uh, there's the science aspect that goes uh, knowledge, so think of tutorial wikis, and access to the infrastructure, to the computational infrastructure, to the grid from one central place. And there are a lot of services. So you see here the VRC as central part. It's, it's a Drupal-based website. So the user can interact. Uh, so you, can re you should register with the VRC, actually. Uh, you find a lot of, of exposure to, so there are news, there are blogs. Uh, you can link to Facebook. There's a marketplace when you can advertise jobs or resources if you want to do so. Uh, there's an entire, there's a large knowledge center uh, where you get tutorials, wikis, help center. So if you have specific questions about uh, uh, an application that you are using within WeNMR or that you are not using but thinking of user, you can in principle also ask questions and those questions are redirected to the software developers behind the portal. So you get experts usually that are going to answer your, your questions. And you get access to the services, meaning the basically the the grid services portals, not all the portals that we are offering are using the grid because some of them are, are very quick in terms of computing time, so they are running on local resources. But we also aggregate there, for example, portals from other people around the world. So some software developers abroad have been contacting us 
uh, asking if their portals could be embedded within this VRC. So that's, uh, that's giving us more tools to offer you and giving them more visibility for their tools as well. So it's a win-win situation. And if you are developing software and you think that you could benefit from being into the integrated into our virtual research community, then you should for sure contact us. So the user might get access to those uh, knowledge centers. So that is, uh, we have to date about 50 tutorials there for different kind of software wikis, and you can contribute as well. If you are registered, then you can also contribute to the to the wiki content. So I encourage you to do that. There are movies describing also the use of the VRC, but also different aspects. Uh, access to the services. So we have 26 web portals operating at this time. Uh, 17 of which were developed by, by partners in a project, but we have also, you see that there are nine that are coming from external partners or software developers that, that contacted us, and we are integrating their tools in our virtual uh, research community. Uh, we have recently added a uh, single sign-on modules, which should ease the access and the management of access to the, to the services, so basically from the VRC you can manage things. This is a snapshot of the website, so it's www.wnmr.eu, and uh, you can, uh, well, you see that I'm logging up there, but that's the place where you can basically register. If you need to access the service and you want to learn about grid certificates, you should look at this access tab. You will find all the wikis tutorial here, and here you get access to all the services, the portals. So you see it's mainly at this time, uh, most of them are all modeling or NMR based, but we are going to add uh, SACS tool very, very soon once they are fully operational and, uh, and easy to use. And so this is a snapshot of the support center. So you get uh, some instructions how to get started. Tutorial wikis, uh, they are classified based on the software that you're in interested to use on. Uh, help center, blogs, and, and there's even, for those of you who are more in, in grid business, you can also post uh, help requests if things are broken. <clears throat> Just a few uh, views of tutorials. So tutorials are in different topics, NMR tutorials for NMR software, SACs, grid-related tutorials, and general things. And you see here a number of the latest tutorials that were added. So I need to fit almost CS Rosetta. Uh, and you can view all of these. Wiki also, a lot of uh, different topics addressed. So you see a lot of, of uh, ad hoc uh, additions here. Uh, but there is uh, much more here. So really, I, again, even if you are not using our tools, I think uh, the, the wiki might be useful for your research because it might provide you useful information even for running things locally. It, it's really a knowledge page center. And by registering, you might be able to contribute here also. So really, it's, I think you should try to, to add content to the website. Good, that was about the help center. So registration also, uh, grid registration is not always simple. Although I think here in Academia Sinica, you're a very, very good center uh, and help center to get certificates. Uh, but getting the certificate is one step. Then you need to, to register with this virtual organization so you can, under the access read registration, you will, you will get uh, help in doing that. Now the single sign-on, just to show you that we are trying to make things easier for you to use. Um, this is, uh, so I'm logging in a system. If I click on my name and I, I get my, my personal web page on the system, so you can see there's a lot of different topics here. Uh, one of them is my services. And this is a list of services, so not all software. I told you we have 27 portals now. Some of them do not require registration, some of them do. And these are the ones that are now at this time uh, have been uh, modified to support this single sign-on functionality. So what does it mean? It means that if you are registered for those portals, and I'm going to show you a little bit the steps, you can use your WNMR VRC credentials, login and password, to access the different portals. Now the situation is, before, well, before we implemented that, the situation was that you have to register for each portal separately, and you might get a different username and password for each of these. Because the portals are running at different sites, they have different requirements. And now with this single sign-on, basically from the VRC website, you can manage access to all of them and use the same password, username, credential to access all of them. So you see here, the green ones are the ones that I'm registered to. So you see are now assuming that I want to, to link to the Amber portal. So the Amber portal is to run uh, 
mainly NMR refinement, uh, so final refinement of structure in explicit solvent, where you can use the restraints, and you will learn about this service tomorrow from, from Antonio, who is sitting here in front. So if I want to register to this server, I will go to the subscribe tab here, and you see the, there are different steps. So this one, you, you will have to complete three steps to get access to it. Uh, it still requires a grid certificate, but it, uh, for some portals in the future, we might just remove these requirements. As long as you are registered within the VRC, you will get access directly to the portals. So then you don't need to go through the certification uh, uh, anymore. Uh, so I need to complete those steps. Uh, so I go for grid certificate, and the system recognizes that I, I'm, I have a grid certificate, which is valid. So I, I'm, I'm fine for step one. Uh, I need to agree to some license agreement for the usage of Amber. Uh, so once you have done this step, then you are fine. And uh, I've done all three steps, so I'm ready to go, just submit. And after submission, in this case, I'm automatically accepted to use the service using my credentials. So now it means that I, if I go directly outside the VRC to the website, I can log in with my username password that I use for the VRC. But it also means that if now I click here on Amber within the VRC website, I go straight in without login requirements because I was already logged in into the virtual research community site. So it's a really single sign-on system. And you see this is just a snapshot of clicking on Amber brings me to this page, and it says, welcome, welcome, Alexandre Bonvin. So it knows who I am because I'm coming from the VRC. So this should really facilitate and ease the, the, the usage of, of, the, of the portals. Now that we have this system in place, we are, we are slowly rolling out this uh, single sign-on to all our portals. So that really from then you have a one point where you enter the VRC, and from there you will access the, the different uh, requirements. And this is the, our service portfolio. So you see that uh, there, there's quite a number of portals. I don't know if this adds up to 27, but uh, probably not. Uh, but there are different topics, and a number of these you will get uh, acquainted with uh, in the coming days. So I'm going to, to tell you everything about Haddock uh, on Wednesday. Uh, you see Explore NIH, Amber. So these are for NMR structure calculation, Amber for, for the refinement. Cyanar is also NMR related. CS Rosetta for chemical shift based structure calculation by NMR um, and, and more servers. And so in the future, you should be able to access all of these from the VRC as a single sign-on mechanism. And we have SAC services for those of you who are especially here for the, the SAC part. Uh, the, the portals are in place and they are functional. Uh, we are in a process of linking, establishing this single sign-on mechanism. And for access to those portals, actually, we will not uh, require certificates, but you will have to register with the VRC. So you should be able, in the near future, to make use of the SACS portals. They are not yet accessible from the VRC. We are in a process of really of testing everything and, and putting the single sign-on. But once this is in place, without certificate, you will be able to access those services, provided you register with the VNMR VRC. So this should make things uh, much more easier. And what these are doing, then you're going to, to hear from uh, Al later. So what is, what is happening behind the scene of most portals? Uh, there is quite a complex workflow. Uh, a lot of software that we are using, uh, again, I, I told you, there is not a one-to-one -one relationship between data and the endpoint of structure. Uh, so a lot of the software requires quite a, a workflow of, of software, of computation to be performed. And we have really decoupled the, the web portal side from the, uh, from the processing side. So we are not, our portals are not built on, on Java uh, portal technology. We usually have a web portal interface that does a lot of validation of the input data. And then at the shell level, there's a processing of the data. And that's at the shell level that the interaction with the grid takes place, submission. And we have developed mechanisms, efficient mechanisms to deal with that. So just a little bit about so our services and, and usage. So what do we represent? Uh, we are the largest virtual organization in the life sciences in grid business. Uh, we have more than 500 registered users. Actually, the count is now 511 since yesterday. And a number of you have been uh, registering recently. I've seen name coming up. 
about 30% of our usage now are coming from outside the EU. So we are a European funded project, but 30% of the usage is really coming from outside the Europe, and you see the map here. So, so Taiwan is, uh, is, is not green, it's yellow, it means you have more users. Uh, India, and you see a lot of Italy, and the US actually is using a lot of uh, our resources as well. We have access, in principle, to almost, uh, well, these days, probably close to 50,000 CPU cores. It does not mean that you have, at this moment, 50,000 CPU cores at disposition, but these are the, the resources that are supporting us. Uh, over the last 12 months, we calculated for about 330 CPU years on a grid. It's a bit less. Last year, we were, in one year time, we did 900,000 CPU years, so there was a different usage. So we see that people are using different portals. Some of them are CPU intensive. Some of them send a large volume of job, but short jobs. So we see that our, our CPU usage last year has decreased, but the job volume has increased. So this is, uh, this is about 1.25 million jobs uh, that are sent to the grid in one year. Uh, so the user distribution, again, you see like, a lot of people from the state, but we also see Latin America, and then uh, Australia, China, not so many users in China. Taiwan is here, India, people are also registering. And until now, these are only the users that are accessing our services using personal grid certificates. So now with the single sign-on, where for some portals, not all portals, but for some portals, you will no longer need uh, the grid certificate. We expect this map to, to become more and more colored in the future. So where, well, we so see the, the Asia Pacific, it represents already 10% of our users, and now with Academia Sinica on board, I expect this, uh, this number to grow. Uh, certainly now that, uh, well, just in the last week already, some of you have re been registering for this workshop, so this number is, is bound to grow, and this is, these are all data already. So what are the grid resource centers worldwide? So these are not the centers that are supporting us, but if you go to uh, the website of uh, GSTAT, which is actually running at uh, Academia Sinica here. These are all the sites around the globe that are providing grid resources to some communities. Uh, so this is the, uh, the picture for, for all possible sites, and this is the picture for the sites that, you, that are supporting us. And, uh, of course, we are lobbying to try to get more resources, and it's not an automatic process. So you see most sites are still in, in, in Europe, but you see here Taiwan, and uh, since uh, very recently, two weeks now, we have uh, support from uh, Beijing uh, High Energy Physics Center as well. And hopefully we will add Malaysia here. Uh, uh, I've been talking to the local people here, so, so hopefully we see more. It will be nice to have a, uh, this map should basically also match the user map. So if, uh, like in the U.S., you see that there is nothing there, but we have uh, most of our users coming from the U.S. Well, we are, we are working on that. And you see the usage patterns, number of CPU hours, number of jobs. So it's fluctuating. It depends very much on, uh, on what people are doing. Sometimes we are also doing large-scale benchmarking for a specific project, and you see the CPU going up. So there's quite a lot of uh, So in the order of 130,000 jobs per month that are running on a grid. So where all, all those jobs have been running, this is last year. So you see most of them have been running in, uh, in Italy and actually on the Dutch NGI. So we have good support from these. Uh, these are two of the partner countries, <coughs> but you also see oversights. Uh, so, so Latin America is there, uh, and it's doing a non. Uh, uh, why is Latin America? It should be. So you see, for example, here the University of Rio was contributing at the same level as some smaller sites in Europe, and um, Academia Sinica should also be showing somewhere here. It's probably in the over distribution here. <coughs> So what are our users using? So people are not using all our portals. I think uh, you are interested in a specific application at a specific time in your research project. You might be using several of them depending on what you are doing, but it's, uh, it depends very much on the researcher. Uh, and I think also if you look at how long do people, we have been doing now some, some research on looking how long do people use web portals and services. I'm going to, to talk about that at the ISGC meeting on, on Thursday, you, you realize that people of, often come to us at a specific moment in their research project and they might be using our services for a couple of months and then they move to the next project and might be spending two years in a wet lab trying to get samples before they come back. And some people are using them on a continuous basis, but there is a big difference in, in, in the usage. 
and you see some portals, a lot of a lot of usage. Uh, this is the number of jobs where it's disappeared on this one. So, so the number of jobs depends very much on what the portals are doing. So some portals are sending a large volume of jobs. One of them is ad hoc here, half a million. So a few examples, and uh, we'll probably have coffee earlier, or Al will start earlier than, uh, than planned, but I think uh, we should give priority to the science. So CS Rosetta, we are not going to speak about CS Rosetta in, in, in this workshop. CS Rosetta is a, what well, the NMR people uh, probably know it. It's a software basically which is trying to predict the three dimensional structure of a protein based on the amino acid sequence. <coughs> and it's not doing this ab initio, but it's doing this by selecting fragments uh, from the PDB. So if you look in a protein database and you make fragments of tripeptides or, or, or peptides of nine amino acid longs, so it's using these fragments to do a Monte Carlo combination and trying to build 3D structure. If you have NMR data, you can bias this fragment selection using the MR data, and this is supposed to get a, to give you better results. But you have to sample a lot in this process to hope to see some kind of energy funnel that will bring you to the right solution. And there is no warranty that because you are seeing this, uh, this is the right one. In this case, the RMSD is, is calculated from the native structure, so you know the answer, and you see that indeed there is a funnel here, but you see some structure here, and maybe if you calculate more, this one will be the native one. So, uh, so you need to sample a lot in, in order to be able to find a needle in, in the haystack. And Rosetta is not always simple to use, depending on what you are doing. If you're going to run it on your local computer, these are the comments that you would have to type in to get the things running. Uh, okay, this is maybe uh, the, the worst case scenario that I, I picked up, but you see that uh, you have very quickly made some error here. And, and then things are not working. And the other thing is, if you're going to run that on your desktop computer, if you're lucky, you might have four cores on your desktop computer, it will still take you probably uh, two months of computing to get everything done. So this is the web portal for CS Rosetta that we have been building, and then it's much more simple. You give uh, the, the input data, which is a specific format for NMR. You, you specify the number of, of models that you want to calculate, and you can go up to 50,000, and that's it, and you're running. And uh, we are actually working now on, on an improved version where you can add data uh, for the NMR people, unassigned peaks from, from noisy experiments that will be used for filtering the solution at the end. But this is consuming a lot of, of CPU time on the grid, but this is perfect for the grid because each structure calculation is an independent one. And in grid business, you want... The, the, the nodes in a grid are not going to talk to each other. So if you have heavily parallel jobs that you need to run, you should go to some supercomputer center and not to the grid. Uh, but for if you have a, a large distributed amount of, of jobs that you need to run, the grid is really perfect for that. So this is CS Rosetta. And what's happening, again, beyond the, the portal, uh, you have your input data. <coughs> you, you need to do some validation then you need to first select those molecular fragments that you are going to use for the assembly process of your, of your protein. And this is not sent to the grid. This is running on a local server in, in Utrecht. And once you have your fragment, then you call Rosetta. And this part is being sent to the grid because this is really the computationally heavy part. Well, this is not very fast. This is also takes you some, a couple of hours, but you only do it once. So we could send it to the grid, but we do it locally because it's simpler. And this is really going down to the grid. And this, we will not like to use our local server to run this because it means that even if you have a large cluster or large cluster, if you have a small cluster with, say, 200 CPU cores, you will still be blocking your cluster for a full week just to do these calculations, uh, which is fine if you, have a, if you have nothing else to do. But uh, if you want to do more science, usually you want to have computing resources. And once this is done and you have some, uh, some scoring validation parts, an analysis, and then the results are, are being presented to the user through uh, web interfaces. So the other example is, uh, is about Haddock, but I, I, I won't say much here because we're going to speak about Haddock on, on Wednesday. But we also have a web portal, uh, which is uh, making use of grid resources, and this is the, the portal that generates the most, that sends the most job to the grid uh, these days, but they are very short in terms of CPU. So Haddock is about predicting the structure of complexes. And then we have different levels of access from very simple interface where you have very little data to input to very expert or guru interface where you can 
specify and tune all parameters that you need. So we have we are getting close to 3,000 registered users for the for Haddock in total, and only about 150 of those users are making use of grid resources because of the certificate issue. So we have a version running on a local cluster. We have a version running on a grid. Uh, Haddock is probably one of the software that will put under this single sign-on functionality, not requiring any more grid certificates uh, for accessing it. So if you are registered with a VRC, you will be able to use uh, also the, the grid portal automatically. About 12% of the computations have been running on a grid in total. So there is a big uh, potential there. And again, uh, there is a lot of validation being done at the beginning and then steps that are being sent to the grid and steps that are being run locally. And the local server also, so we have two versions of this, one sends to the grid and one sends to the local server as well. But this makes uh, things very simple and easy to run. Uh, another example, it's about molecular dynamic simulations, so Gromax. Uh, not your, so I mentioned Amber, and Antonio is going to tell you everything about Amber, which is used more for the purpose of the portal there, it's more to refine and more structures. Uh, Gromax is really about molecular dynamics. Uh, so not a refinement. Uh, it can run in parallel, so actually it does run in parallel on the grid. Uh, so there are sites on the grid that are providing nodes with multiple cores. So most nodes actually have multiple cores these days. Uh, so we don't want to, to use MPI, multi, uh, MPI parallelism on the grid because then you are communicating between nodes and you don't know what kind of architecture is provided by the site usually. So we decided to run it parallel, but only requiring uh, running on a single node. It means that we are running mostly uh, on six or eight processors. If you search the grid and you ask, give me all the sites that have 24 processors or 48 processors, these days you can buy nodes that have 48 cores in one node. Uh, you find there are 48, I think you don't find a single site. 24, you find two or three sites that are offering you some resources. So you can ask for those resources, but you have to wait for a long time before they get free for you. So it's not efficient. At the end, I think for you as end users, you want to get your job done. It doesn't matter if it runs on two core or eight cores, as long as you get the results within a reasonable time. Which is why we are, we are, we are choosing for six processor, because this gives us the largest number of sites accessible uh, to, to run the data. And again, uh, a simple interface, so you can upload a single PDB file, and then uh, the portal will build, take all the steps to build the topologies for Gromax, run equilibration, adding water, adding counter ions to the system, for those of you who are familiar with that, and, uh, and do some kind of equilibration. And then you can take the output of the server and run maybe on your local system where you have more resources, but then the, the entire process of setting up the simulation has been done for you in a standardized way. Or you can keep running on the, on the grid. If you don't have local resources, uh, you have to be a bit patient here because, of course, if you want to generate 100 nanosecond uh, simulation trajectories, then it will take some time. But it's doable. So this is what's happening behind the, the, the portal again. Uh, so there are, you see, eight different steps. So starting from the PDB, converting to the proper force field, so it, there is a formatting issue here, uh, generating the topology, <coughs> minimizing the structure, adding water, minimizing again, and then you start the equilibration phase. So you know, these are basically well-accepted recipes if you run molecular dynamic simulations. Uh, before you start your production runs, you have to equilibrate your system. And this is being done for you in one single step, basically. And these are all the, 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 the executables that are being called actually by those. So this is a, like a meta script that run all of this. Uh, so when you submit to the portal, all of this is run. And at the end, the product basically will be a, a structure which has been relaxed with maybe a, a short one nanosecond trajectory. And then you can decide to extend the trajectory to go in production phase. But at least this is being done in a standard way. And we are also offering uh, not only a uh, Gromos type force field, but Amber is also supported. So there are different force fields supported. So you're not bound to one type of force field. You are bound to using Gromax for the production, but you can choose your force field. You can choose the electrostatic treatment for those of you who are more familiar with that. So you can do particle mesh evolved calculations or reaction fields or different things. I was speaking about the, the parallel resources on a grid. 
So if you are using the grid and if you want to do things at, at your own level, so from, from your terminal, which is, uh, which is possible, you will have to add a number of uh, parameters to your, so this JDL, it's the job description language, is basically the, the, the scripting that you have to do to be able to submit jobs to the grid. So if you want to run on parallel your own jobs, you have to add those variables, basically. So you want six CPUs, and you want uh, CPUs that have a granularity of six, meaning that you want to stay on one node, basically. So we're using multi-threading, no MPI, because the other thing is uh, by multi-threading, so we can pre-compile the code, typically, and you do not depend on local MPI installation, so that's the other thing. You, you, you never know. In principle, a grid is quite... Um, we are... Most sites are running the same operating system, but you are you, you're never sure of what kind of libraries are available. So we try to avoid using local libraries and, and compile the software in a way that will directly run on all of them. So if this is the number of sites. So this is the compute element available as function of the number of core requested. So you see that up to eight cores we have, uh, so this, this is already an old slide, so we had about 35 slide, uh, sites, different sites worldwide that were supporting us, and you see most of them have nodes that have four cores. If you go to six and eight, it, there's a little drop, but beyond eight, then it's dropping really uh, dramatically. Maybe the picture has changed a little bit now. And, and if you calculate how many cores are available for a given number of, uh, because you see, for, if, if you request one, core, it's 20,000, so the picture should be 45,000 now, so this is an older picture, clearly. But you see that above eight CPU cores, then there's basically nothing else. You find something that's still at 24. So maybe in the future, grid sites will have much more cores per node, and we can run molecular dynamics on, on the grid much more efficiently. So I already told you that we are trying to involve software developers, so one of our activities is also to uh, has been to, to really uh, measure how well we are doing these days in terms of uh, automated structure determination by NMR. And uh, we have been uh, setting up this critical assessment of automated structure determination by NMR. And this is uh, mainly the, it's, uh, it's mainly directed by Antonio. Uh, so the, the manifesto was published in Nature Method in 2009 already, basically. and. Uh, so the idea is that uh, we have access to data, NMR data, for structure that have not yet been published. So you might know CASP for structure prediction of, uh, of, of molecules. Uh, so this is the, the NMR version of it. So we get NMR data when the structure are not yet published. And then team, usually these are close to the software developers, get uh, in the order of one month. It depends. Uh, it's usually until the release date of the PDB, of the structure in the PDB, to try to use the automated methods to do the structure assignment, the, assignment the, the, the peak assignment problem and structure calculations. So they have to use automated methods in a blind fashion. And in that way, we are measuring basically how well are the different software approach uh, working. And there are a number of them. Uh, Unio is one of them, for example. Sinai is another one of them. And some of those portals are now implemented in WeNMR. So we're also working on, on workflow managers where in the future we will be able to run different of those automated approaches in parallel and then collect the data for different approaches to do some kind of consensus analysis of your prediction. And you hope in doing that that you can increase the reliability of the method and also increase the, the, the throughput of your work by having these workflows in place. And this is still an ongoing uh, experiment, so if you are interested, if you are interested in, uh, in software, or if you are developing software for automated analysis of NMR data, you are welcome to participate and, uh, in the NMR, in the WeNMR website, you're going to, to find uh, the link to that. And uh, the results of the first round was published uh, in 2012 in Structure, so where we analyzed uh, the results of different software approach for 10 targets. And uh, uh, there is one target running now in the second round. So we have 10 new targets in the second round. And uh, we will have most likely an evaluation meeting uh, in, uh, in June to, to measure how well have we been doing and how well actually are. What did we learn until now? So have the methods been improved, yes or no? And these kind of, uh, of uh, experiments are being picked up by uh, 
HEI, the European Grid Infrastructure, but also from uh, this is the, the Protein Structure Initiative in the US, so blind faith, so can we trust automated methods? I think for the X-ray people in the, in the audience, I think automation in X-ray structure determination is at a much higher level than the NMR, because again, the relationship between data and end product is much better defined than, than in NMR. So I'm getting to the end. So these are all the people in the project that have been involved, and I'm sure that I'm missing a few, so I apologize for those people. All the partners, support from the uh, European Union, of course, and that's all I wanted to, uh, to tell you for this morning. I think now it's time to move to science. This is a movie, by the way, that we also put on YouTube to advertise a little bit the, the, the project. So you, you can find all those movies from the WNMR website, and uh, you can find them also on, uh, on YouTube if you want to see them. <laughs>